welcome to the Big Game Hunting Series brought to you by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm your host, Nate Zielinski. We've been doing this for, for several months now, walking you through the entire process of big game hunting here in Colorado and really uh, achieving success uh, in, in so many different forms. You know, we've walked you through applying for licensing and understanding what's a, a good game management unit for you and, and just the entire process. But now is when it really gets exciting. Not saying that everything else hasn't been exciting, but we've been doing digital scouting and, and everything else, but now we are in field. So we're in field scouting and this is what I call phase one. So phase one of what I'm looking for when I actually get in the field, boots on the ground, where everything is starting to come together. Now phase one is all about what we call daily habits. Now daily habits is food, water, and bedding. Now this is probably the, the hardest thing is we're out here in the field, everybody wants to look for animals. And in phase one, I hate to say it, but I really am not focused on animals at all. So we're here mid-June and really the, the calves are just hitting the ground. So if you have a, a real early spring, you're gonna see all the, the calves and the fall and all the young of the year getting born in early June. If you have a late spring, it might be the third week of June before you, you have 100% of the young of the year on the ground. Uh, so a lot kind of goes into that, but regardless, we're out here doing this phase one, which is always gonna be you know, sometime mid-June, give or take, a little early, a little late. Um, when we're out here in phase one, it is just about filing those daily habits, those daily patterns, to where you're finding good, valuable food source, you're finding great bedding areas, and you're finding really where every Everything can, can drink and find you know hydration and water throughout the course of the year so we're out here mid-June you're anticipating what's gonna be like this coming fall but those are the things that you're you're looking for in phase one of scouting I'm gonna break a couple of them down for you show you some kind of fine-tuning but more than anything I want to tell you what exactly to look for so number one uh, we always talk about food source you just have to make sure that you have all this great green luscious grass um, if your grass source is weak this time of year so mid-June if you don't have a good valuable food source, you for sure are gonna be lacking food come September, October, November, when we're actually in the hunt. This time of year, we should have the best grass of the season. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. That's kind of how I know those things. So make sure that you have good grass. Now, whether you're hunting in low country or you're up a tree line, make sure that you have a very plentiful food source now because come fall, it will be less than what it is now. So if your food source is lacking now, find a new food source. Uh, and I also like to make sure that I have a valuable food source in various areas. I don't want to have one meadow and then dark timber everywhere else and, and, and not be able to you know, sustain that food source. You want to have grass on the east slopes, on the south slopes, on the west slopes. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a lot of food to hold those animals in that area. So food, make sure you have it now because it's, it's not going to get any better come fall. Um, when you talk about water, you break water down into three patterns. You have ponds or, or lakes. You have creeks and you have wallows. Ponds are awesome. It's a big food source or a big water source. I will say that when I have ponds, usually they have to be somewhat remote. Um, when dealing with ponds, I see some animals getting skittish as they approach a pond. I don't know if it's just the vastness of the water source or what it may be, but I oftentimes see animals somewhat getting, you know, a little bit spooky as they approach water. So uh, when you're around that bigger pond area, a lot of times they're in more open country or open areas. Uh, so again, if I'm looking for a pond, I try to make sure that I'm remote. If I have a pond and it's in a somewhat trafficked area, you know, there's four service roads around or something like that, it might not be a, a super sustainable water source. But again, it is still a water source, so keep track of it. Mark it in your GPS, know where it's at. When regards to creeks, I'm actually sitting here just above a creek right now. I'm going to walk down there here in just a second. But creeks are awesome. It's delivering good, fresh, clean water. Animals absolutely love it. The only negative thing to a creek is finding a pattern on that creek. Water is huge, especially during hunting season. They're going to utilize and hit that water every day knowing that water you can build patterns on when they're coming to it when they're leaving it the direction that they're coming and going uh, and honestly in a really hot dry year hunting water can be one of the most uh, successful ways to create a harvest here in Colorado so water is everything within a creek obviously you know you have a creek that might run uh, a mile it might run 10 miles um, you need to know where the animals are utilizing that creek now you're obviously gonna get get animals drinking from the creek sporadically all the time but along that creek you'll almost always find a certain area that those animals really like they feel 
feel comfortable going to, their bedding area is near, their food source is near. So when I come to creek, I walk up and down it uh, and find where they're hitting. And I'll break that down here in a second when I jump to that creek. Um, now, last but not least, and probably my favorite, is a wallow. Uh, when we talk about a wallow, everybody associates that to elk, but everything hits it. Wallows are almost always gonna be in slightly you know, tighter areas. So thicker cover around them. Sometimes they're even in the pines, but usually it, it's a mud base, uh, you know, where it's a natural spring or a water source, you know, binds up around it, but the elk will, will churn it up. They'll stomp around, use their antlers, and they make it literally a mud puddle. Uh, and, and when they make that mud puddle, it's a very cooling area. So the elk use it, they'll, you know, especially the bulls, they'll pee in it. They, they really leave their scent. It's more of a dominant thing, but the mud cools them off. They drink out of it. The cows and calves play in it. Uh, so it is a source that is good now and it only gets better in the fall. And as you get into the fall, especially on elk September and October, you'll see the elk leaving the ponds and the creeks and solely focusing on, on, on the wallow. So that's huge. Now anytime you add that scent, that natural scent of the elk playing in it and, and just again making it their home, it offers a, a very settling environment for, for all your deer species or your mule deer. They love it. They walk into it. They drink out of it. it it's always in that thicker area so they feel safe and more so when they smell the elk and there's all the natural animals going into it they know it's safe so really the elk provide that safety to that wallow which makes it huge and last but not least the bears i've seen bears play around in the wallows i've seen them drink out of the wallows and again they just feel safe around it so when finding a water source i make note of everything uh but that wallow is one of my favorite parts so i'm gonna jump to a clip of actually my favorite wallow where everything in the world i think comes to play and drink uh, uh, so I'll take you to a clip of that right now. All right, when it comes to bedding, not all bedding is equal, and each animal looks for something slightly different. I'm gonna walk you through it right now. Number one, we'll start with elk. That's probably one of the, the biggest animals that we see, you know, new hunters really pursuing, and more so the, the animal that, you know, a lot of hunters struggle kind of putting those patterns on. Uh, so with elk, when it comes to bedding, obviously in the main goal of an animal, it is to rest midday. That's the, the true point of this bedding area for these animals, to get some rest midday. Now they always want cover, they want to feel safe. So you're always gonna see the animals going into some sort of cover. Um, with that, we really relate the temperature and the time of year to their bedding grounds. If it's hot or even warm out, they typically are gonna look for the shadiest, thickest, moist, cool area they can possibly find. So you're looking for that dark timber, steep, um, you know, maybe a creek running through it. Honestly, probably some of the nastiest country you can find. And that's gonna be the primary area where these animals are gonna be bedding down through the course of the day. Now, as you look at the climate for, for elk hunting, um, when it starts getting colder, honestly, it's not till late October, November, uh, when you start seeing those temperatures dropping below zero or extremely cold, that's when they'll start abandoning that dark thick green nasty timber um, and you start seeing them on a little bit more open hillsides sometimes it's like an oak brush hillside sometimes it might even be a real thick aspen hillside even though there's no leaves on the aspens anymore when they're bedded down there there's trees you know or, or you know beams of trees um, sticking up everywhere and they feel safe in it so for an elk it's number one about cover and then we relate that cover to temperature on exactly where they're gonna be uh, since most of our hunts are taking place in September October, even early November, I'm really going to break down a, a bedding ground for you here shortly. Uh, actually, I'm sitting here looking at it. It's, you know, about a half a mile away from us. Uh, I'm going to go up here, kind of tucked away on this dark side of this hillside, a little deep cut. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through exactly what I'm looking for in a bedding ground. But again, you're going to relate that bedding ground uh, to, to what your animals are looking for. So in an elk world, even slightly warm or hot temperatures, it's thick, nasty, moist, you know, heavily shaded areas. Again, it's crazy. And the, the thick cover that they'll go in will surprise you. And then as it warms up or as it gets extremely cold, they'll move to a little bit more openings to let some sun warm them up through the course of the day. I'm gonna walk you through my favorite elk bedding area right now. Come along. All right, so we're here in the elk beds now. 
I'm trying to be somewhat quiet. I don't want to spook them. But just like we talked about a second ago before we hiked over the hill and got in here, it's all about knowing your animals. So right now, I literally just had my eyes on all the elk. They're all around this corner on that kind of flat spot, kind of above what we were just looking at. Um, they're going to be here shortly. So right now, they're still out in the open. They're feeding heavy. Now, come hunting season, this will shorten up, and they'll be in their beds a lot earlier. But like we mentioned, you have to make sure that if you're coming here to physically scout the beds, which to me, this is like a sanctuary. Very rarely do I ever come into the bedding grounds um, but I will just make sure I know where they're at so right now as long as you 100% physically know that the elk are not in here you're not gonna scare them you can come in here and kind of check around but you are methodical about it you are quiet so my feet are, are clean I literally scrubbed them in the dirt right here really kicked up the dirt got all the scent and human flavor and smell off my shoes you're definitely not you know doing anything that leaves scent in these bedding areas but you can see where I'm at right now here is the the ultimate bed setup and actually the true bedding ground is in those dark shades and shadows and that real thick nasty stuff just to the side of me um, but just walking in here I already hit bed so you can see a, a, it's not really a secondary bed but there's so many animals using this bedding area I have a bedding area here and that actually has fresh urine in it uh, so that's awesome and this one also has a little bit of urine in it so it's fresh if you can see that they've been you know going pee basically in their beds and around their beds um, it's active so these animals are here so I have three beds right here just on the outside fresh beds uh, I mean you look over here we got a ton of scat um, so these animals are in here in this bedding area so I know that this is physically my bed now for elk this is my primary bedding ground the elk are almost always going to be in that thicker nastier country and we're, we talked about that earlier a little bit but just kind of reiterate again the, the elk are in the thicker stuff the deer tend to be in a little bit more open country uh, and actually it's crazy because we went through some deer beds on the way here so if you kind of pan just up here just a little bit you can see it's just a little bit more open country um, but but that's where those deer are bedded out and then the elk are this thicker stuff so normally you go in here if you don't find beds like this and you have to make sure during this phase phase one of scouting you want to make sure you know the bedding areas here i would proceed in there since i already hit bedding here i've been watching them go in and out of here i know that that's their primary bed there i don't even want to go in there i don't want to interfere with it i don't want to you know risk leaving scent i don't even want to leave tracks in there i want to leave it kind of their sanctuary uh their safe place that way my patterns always consider but or, or continue but just keep that in mind. So here's what you're looking for. Again, that thick bedding area, you're looking for physical beds. So when you're looking at that physical bed, um, I mean, you're looking to where they usually kick stuff down to actual physical dirt. That dirt is cooler, so it's gonna keep them cool in their bedding area. So it's almost always notorious to see them scratch it down, uh, lay in the dirt. It can be totally dry, it can be moist, but this is the, a, a, a textbook bed of where these elk are at. And obviously the, the more times you see urine, you see you know scat in that bedding area, the more comfortable they are. And it just shows that's kind of a continuous bedding area. It's not an area that they hit one time and moved on. When you see all the sign mixed with the bed, it's more that continuous that this is an active area. They're hitting it on a daily basis. So again, our goal, make patterns. This type bedding area you see right here, it's all about that pattern. As far as mule deer go, and even whitetails, when it comes to the bedding grounds for those, they're not necessarily looking for as thick and nasty country as, say, an elk would. A lot of times, I see them even bed in somewhat open country. If you have really tall grass, they'll lay down right in the middle of that. Uh, you know, they love oak brush. They'll find an oak brush tree or, or a small bush of some kind, and they'll just sit right at the base of it. You know, they love to be in the shade, but they're not really tucking themselves in near as thick a country as you look for the elk in. So, I mean, any sort of cuts, ditches, uh, edge of, of some trees, anything that provides shade and a little bit of cover is where you'll see the, the whitetail as well as the mule deer. So again, you're looking for cover, you're looking for shadows, looking for a cooler area, but I wouldn't necessarily say you're looking for as thick and nasty country as you would the elk. So keep that in mind. And a lot of times it's rare to see an elk in their beds because they're in such thick country, but you can sit behind the spotting scope and you can find a lot of mule deer and whitetails in that. So get up on an opposing hillside, look at those kind of open hills, especially that brushier area. Uh, look at the base, look in the shadows. It'll be crazy that you'll see those deer. Again, they're covered up in shadows, they're in cooler areas, but they're definitely not tucked as way as near as much as the elk. And then as we jump across the board to the bear, uh, a lot of people will always wonder, where do bears live? I never see them. You know, you see them in low light, but where are they at during the day? Uh, they are kind of more on the elk side of things. They really want that thick cover. And even more so, we find them bedding on a lot of rockier country. Um, you know, I hear all the time people are like, oh, you got to go find a cave. Uh, 
you're definitely not looking for a cave. Not to say they wouldn't go in it. Um, but I really see a lot of bears on that heavy, dark timber, but really on steeper faces uh, that have a lot of rock cover. Those rocks stay cool. A lot of times you see them kind of clear out an area right at the base of a rock, and they almost just lean up against that rock. Uh, but I mean, I've seen them on, on a little bit of everything. But bears, obviously, you're going to have these animals having a thick coat. They get extremely warm. Uh, they get a ton of insect flies, mosquitoes hanging around them. Uh, so when the regards to bear, again, thick, nasty country, just like the elk, the only thing that I throw on top of it, if I have the option to look for a rocky face, you know, rock outcroppings, big boulders, uh, if they're in the shade, they're in the dark timber, that's a key area where you're going to find those big bears bedded. All right, so as we talk about, you know, water sources and drinking, you know, we, we broke it down real quick as far as ponds and creeks and, and wallows. Uh, but the biggest thing about a creek, obviously it is fresh water, it's clean water, it's an extremely valuable source for drinking. The biggest thing is building a pattern on it. So knowing a creek is here is awesome, you know you're going to have animals on it, but you know, are they drinking on it a half mile down there? Are they drinking on it a mile up river or up creek? Um, all of that makes a difference to build patterns, to know where they're feeding from and the direction that they're coming from, the bedding areas and where they're coming from. So a lot goes into it. So the biggest thing with creeks, I walk them. Uh, so throughout the scouting process, again, make sure your animals are not here. I actually watched a bunch of elk here this morning, watched them go off into their beds. So I know there's nothing out here now, but I'm gonna walk it and I'm gonna see where they're utilizing it the most. I don't just wanna see one or two tracks. I wanna see where the grass is kind of beat up. I want to see the tracks. So I have an elk track there. I got two or three tracks here, but I don't want to see ones and twos. So I'm going to walk this entire creek uh, and it might take a, a couple outings before I really see where they're utilizing this creek at. Are they going to mash down some of this grass and turn it into a wallow uh, or is it going to continue just being a creek? But when you have mud like this, this is a prime area where you'll get a couple bowls, uh, especially later in the fall where they'll kind of, you know, turn it up. So I make note on this entire creek process, you know, harder bank there that obviously will never be a wallow but on soft patches like this it could turn into wallow so I just simply put a mark on my GPS kind of know where those areas are at but with creeks follow them up and down find where the animals are utilizing it look where there's paths crossing look where the tracks go look where they're, again obviously they're really beating it up uh, that's going to be the biggest stay to, to know where these animals are utilizing it from. Because um, that's huge. When building a pattern, you have to know that. So don't just assume, hey, there's a creek, I'm good to go. Break it down. Now I'm going to walk across here. So I got water here. This side right here, I have very minimal tracks. I mean, I got a track here, a track there where they're walking in it. But if I step over here, <coughs> excuse me, look at this. I mean, I have tracks, 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 tracks. So I have a, a ton of tracks right here. So the biggest reason, you ask yourself, why do I have tracks here and nowhere else? My animals are coming from up in that bedding area, coming down right here, drinking and returning. Again, there's so many clues. Everything that you scout is all little pieces of the puzzle. When you put the puzzle together, you have the answer. And the answers is what creates success for you this fall. So in this situation, I know that they're not walking on. So I can say that, hey, this animal, or this area over here, they're not really utilizing. Everything is coming down, walking here, drinking, and returning back up. So it's all little steps that are gonna help me build a pattern and more understand the timing, the direction, and everything these animals are doing. So if you find a creek, Great job. Now make sure you break that creek down to find, oh, look at this right here. We got elk coming in right behind us. We're on National Forest right here. Those are actually just on the opposite side of a fence on an old cattle ranch, but a uh, bunch of elk right there. Now this morning, I didn't see any of those elk. All those elk were actually, I mean, I probably had a hundred head behind me this morning. Uh, we're way back in here. Again, that's, that's a working cattle ranch, and they might be coming in to feed the cattle, but a lot of elk. You can see they're definitely, uh, well, we got some calves in there. Got some young ones from here. How cool is that? So it's hard to say what, what spooked those animals. But again, you ask yourself all those questions. Uh, again, I scouted this morning or midday. I, I intentionally let these animals go back to bed. So the animals that I've been watching are up on this hill. Uh, again, that's a, kind of a working cattle ranch. We're on, on National Forest. That's a little chunk of pine right there, real small, about 500 acres with some cattle in it. But, uh, they're probably feeding the cattle, pushing the elk around, so not a big deal. But this pattern will continue. Break it down, break down the creeks, break down everything, get the answers that you need. 
just like we talked about, in the case of water holes, you have all the options. You have strictly a source for drinking. You have strictly sources to cool off. Then you have a true wallow. Wallow is gonna be used to, to cool off. It's gonna be used to drink, and most importantly, it's gonna be used almost as a sign where those bulls uh, are, are gonna roll around and kick up in the mud. But really, all your water sources, all animals using, whether it's pronghorn, bear, deer, elk. Uh, and right behind me here, you can see I got this kind of a hole here. Um, it's crazy, I'm actually not even gonna go up to it. I kind of stay a distance. This is my favorite water hole. Uh, this is an area that I've hunted for years. That water hole right there gets used by everything. I have pictures of bear, of huge mule deer, of elk, moose. I have everything that drinks out of that, that rolls around in that little hole right there. It's literally a little crater in the rock that there's some mud in, uh, and it fills with water coming off that rock. So it always holds water year round, and there's always critters in it so I don't even like getting up to it I have a trail camera just aside of me you know gathering intel and when they're here where they're coming from all that kind of thing so keep it in mind but of all the water sources a wallow is my favorite because it's used by everything cooling off leaving scent playing in drinking everything if you have simply a creek it's simply for, for drinking purposes if you have a pond it's kind of kind of a little bit of both but a true wallow is utilized by everything so when I go out looking for water holes I know we showed that creek earlier but my main goal is a wallow just because it's utilized by everything. Uh, so it just hit, gets hit a little more frequently uh, and builds a little bit better pattern. So keep that in mind. A wallow, no matter what the species, that's kind of my favorite source uh, of, of that water between the ponds and the creeks and everything else you can have for can drink out. So a wallow, absolutely key. That's where we're putting our trail cameras. That's where we're building intel. And just like the bedding grounds, when I come in here to check my trail camera pictures, I will never be here when the animals are. So there's times like this where right now we're away from the bed a little bit. The animals are still in their feeding grounds. They haven't even moved to their beds where they're even near this. I can come in here. I can talk. But there's times during hunting season where, let's just say these animals are closer and they're utilizing the bed sooner. There's times where I might have to hike in here, check my tail, trail camera pictures and card uh, at, at midnight, at 2 a.m. No matter what, do the work. We work so hard to build these patterns. Don't ruin it uh, with simple things like this. So make sure that you're only coming in, only checking these type areas when the animals are not here. That's one of those big things that will help you create more successes coming fall. All right, so now a few tips on these daily habits. Number one, the tighter that you can find an area of these daily habits, the better off you're gonna be during hunting season. So if you can have a great valley of green grass uh, where these animals are feeding, and then if you have just up the hill, down the hill, around the corner, you have that thick bedding area. Uh, that's actually a, a key area. So we love seeing that. Um, and then if you obviously have water nearby, that's fantastic. So if you could have a, a half mile or a mile square where you have all those resources, that's going to be a key area where these animals really love. Now, I mean, I've seen areas to where you see animals migrating a mile or more just to get water, and they migrate way back to, to go to their bedding grounds and, you know, vice versa. Um, if you have to do that, if you're such limited on water or food, you deal with what you have. But through the scouting process, seek out and find where you have those daily habits, those daily patterns, those daily migrations. The tighter they are, the easier it's going to be on you as a hunter to, to build those patterns and create that success. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is probably the most important of all. Everything we're doing is about education. We're, we're dedicated to this. You've been following this big game hunting series, you know, for months now. Obviously, you're into it. You have made the commitment to be a more successful hunter here in Colorado. As we build this intel, the biggest thing, do not ruin it. So now that we're boots on the ground, we're out here physically scouting, you need to start understanding when these animals are utilizing these food sources to where say, hey, I know at first light, they're out feeding on this green grass, they're gonna be out here until 9, 10 in the morning. So obviously you don't wanna be traipsing around when the animals are here. Even though it's cool to see them, we want their patterns to continue. Let them feed, let them go off to bed, and that's when you can come check out the food source. Now, if you need to understand a bedding area, so you're like, hey, I, I need to physically make sure I know where the trail is that goes into their beds. I just want to make sure I know where they're bedding. You cannot go in there midday when they're bedding. So if you need to search a, a bedding area, you need to do it extremely early in the morning when the animals are out in their feeding area or, you know, right before dark where the animals have already came out of their bedding area uh, and are now feeding. Same as water holes. You know, if they're drinking right before they go to bed or right when they get out of their beds midday, um, you need to know that. You do not want to be traipsing around, moving around, and interfering with these daily 
habits of these animals. So through the scouting process, we make it our mission and our goal to never interfere with these habits. Let them continue with their normal patterns. It's gonna make it that much easier on you uh, this coming hunting season. So again, I'm Nate Zelensky. This is the Big Game Hunting Series. That was phase one, daily habits, daily migrations. I know it's not as exciting to go out and find those animals like we'll be doing shortly, but phase one, you have to do it. Get out there, find the food, find the bedding areas, find the water. It's the first step that's gonna be extremely important coming up this fall. Now, next week, it's phase two. Phase two is long range scouting. It's about binoculars, it's about spotting scopes. It's all about optics and finding these animals at a distance. Now it's actually counting the animals, looking at the maturity level, breaking down the herds and the groups of animals that you see and putting patterns to them. We then kind of mingle everything that we're learning together and we have a true pattern that's going to create success this coming fall. So again, that was phase one, daily patterns. Phase two is long range scouting. So make sure uh, you pay attention and keep an eye out for phase two coming up here real shortly where it's all about finding the animals.